Three boys in their early teens and one aged 11, growing up in the East End of London. Already these four lives are lives at risk. Already the future shadows them. Paul, the elder of two half-brothers, is 14. Lawrence is 11. Vince is 14. Richard is 14. Paul, the son of a long distance lorry driver, has been in court 10 times. At present, he's on three years probation for breaking into a neighborhood flat. Lawrence, with a history of truancy and thieving, is in care of the local authority. Last year, he was sent away to a boarding school for maladjusted children, which he still attends. Their home is in a relatively modern block of council flats. There are three younger members of the family, two girls and a boy, and the mother is expecting another child. There's prostitution around here. I mean, it's bad. I mean, I can't sort of explain. I mean, there's nine people out of ten are always in trouble around here. I mean, I'm not saying my boys ain't ever been in trouble, because you know they have been. And the mothers, I mean, even the mothers find it hard to keep their children out of mischief around here. I mean, you can't always be behind your child. Vincent is on two years probation for breaking and entering and for stealing a scooter. He rarely goes to school. His parents were divorced three years ago and his father disappeared. Nearly all his life has been spent in the same tenement flat with his two younger sisters and his mother. It's a jungle. It's only the fittest that survive, especially around here. Before he could walk, I had to teach him that when he went into the street, somebody hit him with half a brick to belt him back with something that was ten times bigger. Who is it? Me! He's had to be brought up like that. He's come up with cuts in his head, his fingers hanging off when he was about three or four. And I've had to turn around and say to him, now, take this piece of wood and go and whack him and hurt him, you know. So that's what he's had to have drummed into his head, that when somebody hurts, you've got to hurt him back. But at the same time, I never told him that when people hurt you, sometimes you've got to turn your face the other way. I just told him to sort of lash back. Richard was born in Glasgow, one of a family of 12 children. His father, aged 65, is a warehouseman. His mother, who died this year, left home when he was a baby. He's been on probation for thieving, and he's now in care of the local authority for truancy. 
He lives in a slum basement flat looked after by his sister Patsy. Well, we have to go to the post office, Father. Oh, God. Well, you'll need to go and take the library books back as well. Oh, Mist, you can take them back to your books, no Well, you take them back. I'm always taking the books back. Are you going up to the school? Well, what do you mean that far? You've not been at school for months. Yeah, I'll go up to that school. I get transferred anyway. Well, you were told to go up last. You were told to go up last Friday, and you'd have seen about getting your transfer, but you never bothered, did you? Mr. Wheatley didn't get my transfer. Mr. Wheatley said if you went up and seen that that headmistress before they went into the committee about you, they'd get your transfer. Yeah, but then he told me about the committee. If you'd have seen her first, she would have explained to the committee that the school's too boring for you, yeah. and they'd try to put you to a better school or a higher school. So I don't know what's going to happen now because you never bothered to turn up, did you? Mm. There's nothing I can do about it. You're old enough to take yourself to school. I take myself to school. It's too far away. It's freezing. Ah, oh, don't be so stupid. People go to school no matter how freezing it is. Mm. Who gets through to boys like these? Boys like Vince, Paul, Lawrence and Richard. Are they at all affected by school, the courts, probation offices? Youth worker Dan Jones lives in the area and walks the same streets with them. We were talking recently uh, with Vince and some of the other kids for a long, long, long time, all about all the things he'd been up to and what he'd done. Maybe it was two hours talking, and in that period he didn't mention the fact he was at school or anything about school or anything about the probation officer. And all that time, some of it was talking about things he'd done with me and Jake, talking about a lot of other things, but in the major things that you would think he would be talking about and thinking about, they just weren't mentioned, they didn't figure at all. I think this is significant. It may not be true of all of these boys, but it's true of a large number that the structures that are set up to help them, to deal with them, sometimes seem to miss out altogether. Quite why this is, I'm not certain, but very often the caseworker, the probation officer, the school sees a different sort of picture of the boys than we see. That isn't to say we're getting through at all, I'm not suggesting that. Whoever does get through to them must get through in the context of their neighbourhood, must know the landmarks of their world and of their minds. Green spaces to play upon are few. They fashion their adventures where they can. <laughs> He's your mate. Yes. <laughs> you know what gives you first, don't you? Of course. He's open. <laughs> <laughs> you know what until he gets you on your own way, you're right. Yeah. 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 He take the fingerprints himself. Look at that. Look at that. You've got a light now. You've got alarmed up. Look at the machine. Yeah, all the machines. He's got the keys. Yeah, it might leave the keys in. Yeah. The streets and alleyways of this dockside area, increasingly deserted as the docks decline, are part of their hunting ground. Secret places to investigate, new challenges to search out and accept. <laughs> This is the marginal country where much of their life is spent, where easy temptation invites easy mischief, and where mischief in a moment can cross the legal borderline. Kevin 
mum won't let him play. Dennis Ryan. is gone on holiday. Ryan. Peter Goodman's ill. The clerk's ill. What youth workers like Jake Jenkins, who live in the neighbourhood, are trying to do is to channel the inventive energy of the boys they work with, most of whom have never been in trouble, to make use of the boys' ideas rather than their own. And first and foremost, what they want is football. Oh, come on, win the mic, the Saturday Football League is a combined achievement by youth officers and local residents, and for the boys who take part, the high point of their week. No other discipline is so readily accepted. Often the rules are much less obvious. In the rough and tumble of a countryside outing, youth worker Dan Jones involves the four who've been in trouble with a majority who have not. As a group, they struggle, they play, they invent together. Forty-five. Forty-eight. Forty-nine. Forty-nine and a half. Fifty, I'm coming. Fifty, I'm coming. Fifty, I'm coming. Fifty, I'm coming. Who put that there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, Mickey, you're gone. Mickey, Mickey, you're gone. Mickey, you're gone. Mickey, you're gone. Mickey, you're gone. Ask one of the young ladies they want to go. I wouldn't mind catching one of them. Yeah, gone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that, girl. You catch your boy up. <laughs> Break your neck! <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Hey, Ben. You're all right. You're all right. Hit you on the head. OK. Why don't you have a go? Lift your legs up. Up. Right. Mind up, mind up. Whoop. Why? Oh. <laughs> oh, let's go, Ben. That's all I like it. Let's go, Mark. Well, I, I missed about one in four. And they hit the tree. <laughs> you got him in the face. That's very clever, isn't it? Well done. What did I tell you not to do? I was right and you got him in the eye. What did I tell you to do? I never done it! It wasn't me! Now you're holding your hand the wrong way. Can you push the rope past? No, like this. Like that. Just bring it round there, it'll hold you. Now you must lean out further. Lean out more, go on. I know it's... It's bloody dangerous. It feels it, but it's perfectly safe. Go on. Right, step down. Step down a bit. You're all right, you're all right. Now then, lean out more. Now you straighten your back because you've got the, the sling has slipped up now. Now, the, now keep your feet stationary and lean out more. You're rarely resting now. Can you straighten your back more, Vince? Try and straighten your back. Straighten your back more. Straighten your back more. Lean out more. Lean out more. Go on. Lean out more, I'll be up upside down in a minute. No, that's Vincent good. will definitely do plenty of prison when he gets older. I'm positive. It's been bred into him. That's it, you're getting, you're getting the idea now. Keep your it's been bred into him since he was born, it's been bred into him. It's been bred into him all the time that he's lived here. When something is bred into you over 14 years, it's very, very hard to get it out of your system. What is it really that you like to teach him about life and living and surviving? You know, what's the most important thing you feel he needs to know? He has to know that you can't just, just go out and take what you want. You've got to work for it. If you want people to respect you, you've got to learn to respect them and their property. It's a very hard thing to try and learn the two things, isn't it? To learn that, if, as you say, it's necessary to lash back in certain situations. At the same time, to learn to respect other people. How do you... How can you learn the two at the same time? Well, I've tried to tell him that these people that hurt him physically, like by hitting him across the head with something, then he's got to hit him back. But regarding other people's property, I've said to him, if somebody broke into this place, what would you feel like? He said, I wouldn't like it. I said, well, now you know how people feel when you break into their property. 
He does understand that. He has got through to him. He does know right from wrong. A lot of people say that people like you get into trouble because of the background, because of the area that you come from. Do you think that's the reason, or do you think it's your own fault? Sometimes it's my fault, sometimes it ain't my fault, and sometimes it's the area's fault. Now, why is it the area's fault sometimes? Well, there's, like, there's too many houses to do, isn't there? It's tempting. If you lived out here in the country, there's not so many houses. So you wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't be doing houses because there, no, there ain't enough of them to do. It wouldn't be worth your world. You know, so then you'd move into London, say, you know, and you'd see all these asses, and you wouldn't be used to doing asses. So I doubt if you'd do it. You know, you'd be a bit scared, but you'd grow up in it and you'd get the bottle, like the guts to do it. But why can't you resist the temptation? Well, like the judge put it once, I've got a crim 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 criminal mind. Do you think you've got a criminal mind? Well, I like think, you know, I like sitting in bed at night thinking about, thinking about jobs that I'm doing. You know, next day. Do you think about the fact that you might get caught also? You don't think about the fact that when you're in the air, and it's too late, you think about that fact. But what about his attitude towards the police? I mean, what, what sort of attitude towards the police do you have that you try to put across to him? My real attitude towards the police have to hide from Vincent. I can't tell him straight out what I think of them. But he's seen it himself. He's got his own attitude towards them. I don't have to turn around and say they're good or they're bad. I've tried to tell him they're ordinary men in a uniform doing a job. But, I mean, do you regard them ever as being on your side? or do you? No. See? No, they're not on my side. If they was on my side, they wouldn't keep coming over and turning me over without warrants, with search warrants. Just on anonymous phone calls. I suppose to have had stolen property, I suppose to have had this and the other. Vincent's seen all this. He's got no faith in the police no more than I have. When did you first run up against the police? Do you remember? I can't remember. About seven, eight. Was it a shock when it happened? It was quite a shock. Uh, it was done for breaking an entry. It's only seven or eight. What did your mother say? It's not what she said, it's what she'd done. So I was battered around the room. From one room to the other, you know, begging for mercy on my knees. She's saying the only mercy you'll get is another slipper. Wake. But it didn't make much difference, did it? No, you only you knock one devil out, you knock ten in, they say. Do you think that, um, you're going to keep on getting into trouble. Things are going to get worse. I don't want to get into trouble. You know, but it's tempting, if you know what I mean. Sometimes, like, you're walking out, you don't want to do nothing. And, uh, you'll see something that you, oh, it's dead easy, you can't get caught. And you go and do it and you do get caught. You know? So you do it again and try not to get caught. You say he, he confides everything in you. What, what about his father? What's the relationship that he has with his father? Neil. Absolutely nil. He's been ignored since he was born. His father was living here up until about four years ago. He ignored him right up until then. He still ignores him now. Do you think that's made much difference to him? Do you think it's had much effect on Vince? It has had a lot of effect on him. Every boy, well, every child comes to that wants two parents, not one. Um, Vincent's father was here, he would go to the football. Vincent would say, can I come? He'd say, no, I'm going with friends. Here's the money, you go on your own. Yet he was going to the same football ground. He was snubbed all the time. That's why the child... The child is like he is over his father. Maybe it's my fault as well, I don't know. Um, the conditions that he's living in. There's four of us got to sleep in one bedroom. He's got no privacy. If he brings friends here, they say that he lives in a pigsty. Um, they just torment him afterwards. That's why he stopped bringing his friends in. Except friends that come from the same background as him. Do you think that, I mean, in what way can you compensate for the fact that his father isn't here, make up for the fact that the father's not here? I can't. 
You can't compensate. One parent can't compensate for two. What about your mum? Do you worry about what she might think when you do get caught doing something? You worry about what she's going to say? Well, it's not what she's going to say, it's what she feels, isn't it? I, you know, she f like, last time I got in trouble, she said she didn't feel like coming to play stuff. She just like, felt like putting her head in the oven. Yeah, chatting us all out and putting her head in the oven. Why did she feel that? Yeah, you know, she's fed up going to the police stations, having to pick me out all the time, and running up the courts with me. I understand this now. It was, it was too late, I know. But I understand it now. Do you ever see your father now? No. I might see him once, now and again, but otherwise I don't see him at all. I don't care if I see him or not. Do you remember much about him? No, I never, when he lived at home, we never used to hardly see him. You know, I was in late at night and out early in the morning. But do you miss having a father around the house or not? No. Like you can get away with more with your mum, can't you? What about school? Have you ever been interested in any school that you've been to? Well, I like St Paul's, the old primary school I went to. It was a small school, you know, and in the big school I go to now, you just, you don't even speak to the headmaster, you only see him. In the small school, you used to get on with the headmaster all right. You used to see him every morning, you used to say hello, you used to do projects with him and things like that. But you don't go to school very much, do you? No, cos I don't like it. No, I don't like this school. I'd go to school if I like the school, but I don't like the school. Where can the, the path that Vincent is on now, petty, petty offences and so on, where can that lead him, do you think? can lead him in only one direction, really. He'd have to try and prove all the time that he is a bigger crook than somebody else. The more times he has to prove that, the worse he's got to make himself. He'll go from breaking into houses, most likely stealing lorry loads, or breaking into factories and stealing lorry loads. Then it most likely start, um, well, it could start from the beginning really at magging people, like rolling in the street for a few bob, especially seamen, which you get a lot of round this way because we're right near the docks. There's a lot of magging going along round here. They wait for a seaman to be paid off. Um, they usually watch in the pubs that the seaman drink. Roll him if he flashes his money when he comes out. Then go on to bigger things from there. Well, you can see this because this is the pattern that others have followed. Most of them have started out like Vincent. Most of the, the ones that the police call the big fish have started out like this way. They've started out with no chance at all. They've practically been given the same sort of chance that Vincent has got. The more publicity the police have given to the, um, these people, then the more they've gone out of their way to make themselves look bigger. What's your ambition, Vincent? What do you really, what kind of life do you really want to live when you grow up? I wanted to be a footballer. Stars life, all the girls around you. Yeah, but tell me about the stars life. Tell me what appeals to you about it. Oh, starlight, you don't have to, like what I'm doing there, go out to rob and things like that. Uh, yeah, like, use Bobby Moore for instance. He's going to America, yeah, just to meet Sheen Comrie for a cup of tea. Uh, his wife's going to Spain because she's fed up for a couple of weeks. Yeah, he's got all this money. Yeah, he can go anywhere he wants, can't he? He can get away from it. like. When you live around this way, you've got to put up with it all the time. It builds up on your chest. You know, you just can't go anywhere and get it all off your chest and have a, you know, have a nice holiday. I've never had an, I had an holiday, a decent holiday, since I went to Bognor Regis. So that was a few years ago. What are you doing down here, Bob? You go down here, please. Yeah, do the upside down. Ah! Ah, me foot! Is he going to kill me? They hit your ankle, Vince. You want to keep your back really? You dead? Pull! Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. Well, pick up your bones after. You know what I mean? Like, I'll stay there, stay there, stuck. Look at him. Stay there, stay there, stay there.
Well, she's hey, mate, well, hold on. His head. No, no, try. Don't use that unless you have to. <laughs> A childhood accident to Paul's right arm left the muscles practically useless. His determination has done much to compensate. <laughs> oh, well done. You've reached the top of Everest. Hey! Help, Vincent. Robust though he is, Paul's only opportunity for regular football is at the special school he goes to, a school for the physically handicapped. However necessary for him the school may be, it manifestly sets him apart from his friends outside. If you're satisfied that you've discovered all the acute ones, have a look for the, the duller ones, the obtuse ones. And it's clearly that one. That would be the right angle, the quarter turn. Okay? Now, if it goes half the dirt line, it's there. Despite his handicap and despite the worry of probation, he is still in one sense more fortunate than his younger brother. Unlike Lawrence, he has not been sent away. He still lives at home. Home, compared with many others in the neighborhood, is neat, well furnished, well equipped. However, for these modest luxuries, the price the parents have to pay is a heavy one more than the father's lorry driver earnings could afford, and more than simply cash. Four evenings a week, from 5.30 till 9.30, Paul and Lawrence's mother is out working in a factory, packing tea bags. Like other women on the so-called mum shift, she's helping to pay for the comforts of home for a family she doesn't often see. Oh, I don't have much time. I mean, you can tell by the four days I'm at work, and I'm only on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. I mean, I've only got three days room. They have, both of the boys have been in trouble. Um, do you think that this is one of the reasons maybe that do you think that if you had more time with them that maybe it wouldn't be like this oh i feel responsible in some ways because i'm not here as you know all the time and uh i think if i was here more often if i could be here more often or if we could go out different places like to see shows or take the boys somewhere which we can't do i think that do a lot in all form of they'd be all right in that way but as you know we we can't afford to take them out i mean i've got five i can't afford to take them out i've already spoken to my oldest boy about the law that i've told him that you you can't sort of go over the law you know he thinks because he does a bit of gets himself into trouble, I should say. He thinks he's, he's great, you know? I mean, that's, it's not a nice thing for himself or for his mother and father. I mean, his mother and father feels guilty their self. I mean, because other people might think they, we say, well, it doesn't matter, they can go out, we don't care what happens, you know? But it's not true. I mean, they found him early hours of the morning. That's the oldest one I'm talking about, because the Lawrence, that's the one next to it, Paul. He's never stayed away, you know, like stayed out late. The latest he's ever been out is 11 o'clock. Do they listen to you when they do get into trouble and you talk to them? Do they pay much attention to what you've got to say? Well, they... They don't say nothing. I mean, this is what hurts me more. I mean, when I have to go to the police station to sort of collect them, 
I mean, they don't say nothing to me and it hurts me more because I'd like to know why they do these things. And they won't tell me nothing. Do you think there's any chance that you could get sent away if you keep getting into trouble yourself? Yeah. And would it worry you if you were? I suppose it would. What about your parents? Um, when you do get into trouble and they find out about it, what do they say? I go mad and zip. Uh, starts shouting at me and screaming, what do I do this for, what do I do that? And the same thing. The, what difference does it make to you, though, what they say? I don't know. Now, does it worry you, though? I mean, if, if they do go on like you say they go on about something, does that, does that bother you? Not much. Lawrence, Paul's half-brother and youngest of the group, sees home and his home neighbourhood least often, a few days off from boarding school, apart from holidays. When he was sent away last year, the local authority made his length of stay dependent on behaviour. He doesn't know how long he'll be there. Tell me about the area, Lawrence, that you live in. What sort of an area is it? Well, it's a, it's a strict area where all the houses get breaking into, all the jobs get done around there, the shops and that. You just can't walk out your house without anybody touching anything or breaking in there. Well, you, do you know many, many people who have been involved in things like this, who've got into trouble for things like that? Yeah, I have, but I've stopped it. My brother has, Vincent, Richard, uh, mm. some of the kids. Why do you think you did get, you got into trouble? Why did you start? Well, when I was young, I used to go around with uh, some boys, and then they done, it was a gang called the Daily Gang, and I used to, go around with them. They used to do asses and I didn't want to get involved and I told them to, so, so I was going to get beat up. So I'd done it with them. Then I, I went around with them all the time and I kept on going. Just that one. What do the, the other boys in the area think about people who do things like this? Uh, I don't know. It's all they're worried about is if they don't get caught. Mm. And their own ass don't get done. Yeah, but I mean, do people think you're tough if you if you are in trouble, if you do get into trouble? No. As far as I know. Mm. I don't go around like a big head. My brother does that. He's mad. He thinks he can beat up everyone he sees. One of these days he's going to get his head kicked in. Does he think he can beat up you? He can. But one of these days I'll shine. What do your parents say about you getting into trouble? When it happens, you know? They don't, they just built me. They just tell me not to do it. And ever since I've been put away, I got into trouble. How do you think Lawrence feels being away from home? Because you yourself know something about this, don't you? I do, because when I was 14, I was in a convent. Not for 
same thing as Lawrence. I mean, my mother was very ill and they had to put us in a home, you know, so they put us in a convent. And I used to lie there of a night in bed. That's the only time you used to sort of think more while you was in bed, you know, and I used to say to myself, I wonder if my mother and father still loves me, you know, and if they miss us and things like that. And that's what I think about Lawrence. That's where he feels it more of a night time. I think he lays there and wonders why he's there and why is he the only one there and not his other brother, Paul, you know? Because, as you know, Paul's been in trouble the same as Lawrence. A day at home, a day ended. Another journey back to school begins. School for Richard has become a rare experience. Although he's now officially in care of the local authority, he still hasn't been to school at all for four months. It, it's clear. It's, it states the message. Mm -hmm. So there's no problem about that one. In fact, I think all three are fairly easy because the second one says staff only. Uh, where might that be? Uh, Robert, let's have one of your notices read out, if you please. I'm pleased to live Whatever it is that has kept Richard away for so long, despite the efforts of the school counsellor to get him back, it is certainly not, in the opinion of his teacher, lack of ability. Oh, he's well above average, intellectually. In fact, I, when I first took him, uh, over in September, I wondered why he uh, had not been accepted for a grammar school two years ago. Um, he's an intelligent boy, as we've established, and I, I think he's uh, got a little bit of the gambler instinct in him somewhere, and he's decided that uh, the life he has chosen to lead by not coming to school is, uh, suits him more than school does. And, uh, the gambling business comes in and as much as prepared to take a chance and stay away from school because uh, nothing yet has, uh, nothing drastic has happened to him as yet. I mean, he hasn't been uh, hauled before the magistrates on a truancy charge or his parents haven't, uh, either or both. And uh, I, I think at the moment he's decided to keep going or keep staying away, whichever you prefer, and until something does happen, possibly hoping uh, that nothing will happen. But even given the, perhaps, the gambler's attitude mm. that he's taking, he wouldn't stay away this long if he really felt that school meant something positive to him, would he? Well, he probably doesn't think it does mean anything to him. No, I mean, this is, this is more than likely, I and mean, this is an attitude that uh, a lot of them have, but they don't uh, do what Richard has done. What's going to happen next about you not going to school? I don't know. I uh, heard uh, yesterday you heard off Dan Jones that I've got to have a psychological test next week to find out if I'm clever. I think if they think they am, I think I'm, I'm going to get a transfer, but I don't know. Do you know how they're going to find out if you're clever? No, no. We'll put, put little bricks in front of me and ask me, fix them in order and all that. And ask me questions and all that. That's what I think they've got to do. Do you think you're clever? I don't know. I don't think I'm stupid anyway. Paul, what do you got for a swim, lad? Uh, I'll give you a little push. <laughs> See, side. Parental influence, in Richard's case, is minimal. His mother, now dead, left home before he knew her. His father is 50 years older than he is. He's cared for by his sister, Patsy, in their present home, one of the worst tenements in the area. Well, he's always, he, every so often he, he comes in and he says to me, do you think you'll ever get out of this place? Do you think I'll ever have a room in my own? And I, you know, I always just say, I, you know, shortly these flats have been taken over and that. I think sometimes you just think, you know, that he's, he's doomed here somehow or other. Well, what's it like to, to have to run a place like this? That like you've got here. You just got to do it. That's all you can do. How difficult is it? Well, it's difficult because I, I just live from day to day. Every day I've got to keep a certain amount of money every day to see me through the week. And how many people have you got here? 
Uh, my father, Richard Stewart and myself. That's pretty cramped. Yeah, it is. But still, there's nothing I can do about it because I've been... I've, I think I've been to almost everybody I can be to, to see if I can be rehoused. What, what about Richard? Do you feel that you're very close to him? Oh, I I'm as close to him as... I think I'm the closest to, to him than anybody is. What about his father? His father, I, his father's close to him, but I think there's such a big gap between him and my father, you know. When did his uh, mother leave? Oh, his mother left when he was uh, nine months. Why did she go? Well, well when, I, when she was in hospital there the last couple of weeks, you know, she was, I think she was thinking back, you know, in her past life. And she says to me, if they're the big family she had, and never, never been able to go anywhere, and never having any money, and just living from one day to another, and never any changes, and my father never having big wages, and everything just being the same, she just thought her life was um, passing her by. So she, she packed up and came to London. Well, she didn't pack up; she just put her coat on. She didn't have anything much, and she came to London. How big it was the family? The whole family. The whole family at that time, they'd be 11 years living. How do you feel about her uh, putting her coat on, as you say? Well, I think everybody's got a right to, to do something in their life that they feel they have to do. And I think it just got too much for her in the end, and she just went. She went away when they were living in another city. Another city just like this one. Just like any city where, even as old buildings are pulled down, old problems linger. Poverty, deprivation, crime. Whatever outsiders can do or want to do to help, there are many who believe, like Richard's radical elder brother, Duncan, that the best hope must be the energy of the people themselves. You want to sort of completely change it all over so that the people that have to live here, you know, enjoy living here, not just put up with it, you know, or just survive here. When you think ahead about the, the life that Richard may have from the age that he now is, how do you feel? I mean, this, he's your brother, he's not just another part of society. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that, that's the really depressing thing, man, you know. You, you know, so, no, well, why are you making this film? You know, you picked an area like Stepney, presumably because people down here are not too well off, you know. Like, you know, that might be Richard, you know, he might just be another part of some place like this, you know, and you can come along in 20 years' time with the same camera and the same people and make the same programme. You know, and, and nothing will change. You know, it's like the social workers, you know. They, you know, they invented it around here, you know, social work, you know. They're coming back here a hundred years later, you know, coming on the same streets, same same problems, sometimes even the same families. You know, you know if you think, well, you know this is bad, you know, you, you, you sort of, you, you're here for that reason. You know, it bothers me, man, you know, that this should be allowed to continue for hundreds of years, you know, and nobody did nothing about it except sitting back and letting the so-called social workers and authority look after them. And point of fact, they don't. They, they just contain them and stop them doing anything for themselves. You know. And that, that's what bothers me, man. You know. It's got, you've got to change a place. It's got to be done by the people who live here. And not put the faith in other people, you know, who don't live here. You know, except come down here from Hampstead once a week and give us a gut feel of, the, of their, their goodness, you know. You know, that, that'll be rich to his life, you know, unless he actually wakes up for him, so not wakes up, but realises. Uh, places like this are going to change, you know, are going to get better. You know, it's got to be done by the people who live around here, and he's one of them. It's very much so. He's the up-and-coming generation. But do you say you come back in 20 years and it will be the same? The very fact that you're involved as you are in politics and whatever one thinks of your methods, the fact that you're involved like this must mean that you believe people can change the situation. Of course. You know, why not, you know? So who changed history? It wasn't governments, it was people. It was people doing things for themselves, you know. And that's why people have revolutions, you know. People, people rise up, they rebel, you know, they take control of their own destinies, you know. That's what's got to happen here. People have got to try and control their own lives. 
for, for their own advancement, for their own betterment. You know, I'm bad for the neighbours, for everybody. Like, that's got to happen, man, otherwise, you know. It's just going to get so bad, man, you know, it's not going to be worth living anywhere. You, know. you talk much to Duncan? No. He talks to me, but, but I don't talk much like What does he talk to you about? About his revolutions. He's told me all his Che Guevara's and all that. No, I don't, I don't, I don't listen to him much. But, but what, I like Duncan. Yeah. What kind of things does he tell you about revolution? About Che Guevara, really. all them and the, all the Russian politicians and all that. You know, and the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, all them. And he, he always gets me books. Tries to get me books. And got me some like, encyclopedias and four, four or five. Do you read them? I've read them, yeah. I don't, I don't know where to go, I must have lost them. But it was a bit old, that one. I think it must have been a couple of seasons ago, a couple of years ago. But they're all right. You've been, into, you've been in trouble with the law a few times, Richard. Yeah. What, what kind of things was it for? Stealing. Yeah. Breaking an entry. It's mostly stealing. Just going up West End, you're going to all the big stores. Yeah. It was just all the stuff that was just on the counters. And the assistant would be right at the other end, talk to some old woman, so, and it'd be lying around. And you might see something, you might say, just, just pick it up and put it in the bag, so. And you walk away and you walk around the store, playing all the toys. Not people, that's off the roof. You have a laugh. Then when you go out, you might just walk along the street. Two coppers are coming, so. Just stop you and ask them what you got in the bag, when you can't tell them where you got it, they say, oh, I think you better come down to the station. I'll take you down. Why, do you, why, why did you start doing things like this? I don't know. Because it was because all the other kids used to do it. Do you, feel, do you think, ah, oh, start calling you chicken, so you go, ah, oh, I'm not. So you go up there and you do it. They call you chicken if you don't do it? Yeah. Yeah, and if you do it, when you come back with all this stuff, everybody thinks you're great and all that. Come around, you know, I think you're fantastic. But don't mind. But you've been you've been caught several times now, haven't you? Yeah. Where do you think it's going to lead you if you keep on doing things like this and keep on getting caught? I won't keep on. Don't keep on doing it or getting caught, which? I won't keep on doing it. Well, I used to think it was good, but it's pretty stupid. Once you get caught, find out what's going to happen. I think you can get help, but I don't think any social workers or anything are really interested in, in kids for these things. They, they don't care. I think it's just a question. Of, if they go to school, they learn so much at the state school and that's enough for them. Mm -hmm. I don't think they'll ever... They'll ever a few kids will get out, them that are, them that will stick it out and they'll go to the public library and go to night school and that. The other ones that will get out. They're the only ones that's got a chance. They must go, they've got to stick it out and gee up, say, maybe years of their youth going to night schools and reading and things like that. They're the ones that'll get out. But the ones that don't do that, they'll not get out. They're the next generation's labourers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 